at those beautiful different coloured honeys coming into this hive here in the apiary at Flow Hive HQ and they represent the flowers of the seasons as, this, as the flowers change, the different honeys the bees bring in. So I might just harvest a little bit, we're a bit low on honey in the tea room here. So I'm just turning this key, putting it in like this, giving it a turn and pretty soon we'll see the honey starting to come out of the tube here. In fact, here it is already. So isn't that beautiful to watch? We're going to be doing a few things today. We're going to harvest this little bit of honey, but we're also going to be getting right inside a beehive. There's a swarm that was uh, we've caught uh, recently and we were halfway through inspecting it last week when the power cut out, so we lost transmission there. We're going to get back in there and have a look. It's beautiful to watch the new wax, so stay tuned and also put your comments in below. We want to hear your questions, so questions in below and we will get to answering those live. So it's all about learning. Don't be afraid to ask questions and away we go. Look at that honey pouring out now. It's beautiful. It's coming out nice and warm here today, which means it's nice and fluid and it'll probably pick up to, to a nice pace as it flows out and into the jar. And notice this lovely artwork here by Sarah. It's a beautiful, beautiful hive with uh, an amazing artwork you can see there. And around the side of the hive here, we have uh, the whole gestation cycle starting off from a tiny little egg in the bottom of the cell and working its way right up to to a large larvae and then there's the, the metamorphosis process and they emerge as a, a beautiful bee look at the color of that coming out of the, the hive here i'm going to have to taste that and see just what it is and i also noticed a little globule coming out there if you watch the stream closely you'll notice there's this little jelly like uh, uh, globules coming out and that's the medicinal honey from the Australian Manuka so this would be a good one to put aside and keep on the shelf for those times when you've got a wound it's amazing healing properties that that honey has especially those medicinal ones that we have here in in Australia and New Zealand so oh yeah quite a quite a mix this one it's got the, the tones of the, the winter flowers here in the heathland as well as a bit of the, the springtime blossom. So we're going to let that just uh, fill up that jar for us. Now if we're going to walk away it's not a bad idea to cover up the jar just so that uh, if bees do notice it, sometimes they do if the bees are hungry. If there's a flow on now, I'm not concerned at all, they're very unlikely to come around but just for the demonstration purposes, a bit of, uh, a bit of wax wrap or a bit of kitchen wrap and you can just cover that right up um, around the, the jar like that and that'll just limit any bees from, from jumping in. Quite a simple thing to do. Okay, so I've got my smoker here, getting it going. You want bellows of nice, cool smoke coming, coming out and uh, good idea to smoke your hands too. Bear in mind that it's going to get a little little hot the smoker so you don't want to burn yourself on it there we go now it's working and we're going to wander over to this little hive in the corner we'll be popping off that lid and and uh, getting right into the hive we might even see the queen again today I'm going to put this right in the uh, entrance of the hive give it a few puffs it's only a small colony so it doesn't need much smoke and uh, if you have the time, give, give it a, a minute or two before you lift the lid off the hive. Good time then to put on your, your bee suit, however you like to protect yourself and make sure the zips are, are done up. Some people do um, have quite, uh, quite large allergic reactions to bees. So just bear that in mind as you get used to beekeeping and monitor how you go if you do get a, a sting um, and the roof comes off like that then it's just a case of lifting off that inner cover now we're going to use the the j tool that comes with our suits and jacket kits 
just levering off under under the lid here you can see that this hive is really starting to do well it's a swarm we caught um, now uh, seven weeks ago or so and they're doing well I'm just having a quick look on that inner cover for the queen sometimes she could be up there you don't want to orphan her from the hive if you can help it but as usual put it up against the entrance so that if she is there she can climb her way back in she can be a bit too heavy to fly when she's in egg laying mode she just stays in here making uh, uh, making babies laying those eggs and she needs to lay an awful lot to keep up with the population of the hive because after all these worker bees might only last uh, let's say uh, four to six weeks in foraging season and if, if there's now probably um, 15,000 bees she's got to keep up with that turnover every four to six weeks and as the colony grows that gets even more so she can lay up to a couple of thousand eggs a day. Now I hardly need any smoke here I think I'll just leave the smoker at the entrance to keep that nice whiff of smoke coming into the hive we're going to take out this edge frame and see what is on it. So they haven't quite drawn all of the frames yet, but look at that. Isn't that spectacular? The way they have their architecture. Somehow they manage to build this beautiful hexagon structure, which happens to be the strongest structure you can build. A lot of designers copy the honeycomb frame when they're, when they're making things in our world because it's it's actually their strongest structure with the least amount of resources and sometimes this structure can be holding an incredible amount of weight say three to four kilograms and it's just very light wax it's a, a beautiful thing and somehow the bees manage to build that without uh, without having um, I'm not sure how they do it because it's one bee will only build a portion of the cell so how they keep their pattern together I don't know but they're they're building that on on the comb guide which is really nice we're going to lean that up against the edge of the hive here or you can clip your shelf brackets on the ones we use for harvesting to really um, to, to rest your your frame on so they've got a nice double use Look at that beautiful, a lot of honey, which is typical in the edge of the hive. You can see they're, they're drying out that nectar and even starting to cap it at the top. What we mean by capping is they add a layer of wax on top of the uh, frame. I'll just turn that around and show you what I, I'm talking about here. And don't forget to put your questions in the comments below. So here, they've decided that the honey's ready. The moisture content is below that 20% range. So the honey is, um, won't ferment. So they can just put a lid on that, like putting a lid on a preserving jar with wax and uh, that'll keep there as stores for later. And like if you ask, they make enough honey for us to have some too. So it's a beautiful arrangement with us looking after the bees, them doing their amazing pollination and of course the, the honey production so so good to see the fresh of course it doesn't always look like this you see many of our inspections with with older comb that's really dark in color and that's okay and normal too as they get darker um, if it's been a few years in the hive you might want to start cycling some of the older dark ones out and give them some fresh space to make some nice uh, fresh ones again just to um, keep the hive happy and healthy for the longer term but you won't need to worry about that if you're starting your hive uh, till down the track again put your questions in the comments and we'll start answering them okay we've got some brood here on this side and some brood on that side now I'm going to be very careful not to tip this frame I don't want it to fall out and it they haven't attached it to the side walls here. And they are going a little bit offline at this end of the frame, actually. See how they they were drawing it nice and straight. We might even show you how to fix that up as we go. When you're using foundationless frames like these ones are, 
the bees could get a little uh, offline and if you catch it early you can just simply get your hive tool and push it back on. You can see by the way it's got a curve there Then what happens is the next frame they'll follow that curve and it can get progressively more wonky so if you can get it early and push it back in line that, that's uh, ad advisable. So I'll show you how to do that now just by um, getting the chisel end of your hive tool and we might even just use a little bit of smoke to get the bees out of the way because we don't want to squash them. Um, so just adding a little bit of smoke to that area and the bees will then just vacate that zone and give us some room to work. Now all I'm going to do, and I'll just get those bees off my hand there, and there's one it's a young nurse bee, you can tell by the way it's, it's uh, kind of lighter in colour and it's a bit, bit furry. So, out of the way, you're busy doing something down that cell. Okay, now all we're going to do is grab this and push it back online. And don't be afraid to damage the comb a little bit, the bees are very good at fixing that up. So here we are, now it's straightened and the bees will then do a better job of following suit with a nice straight uh, comb. So there's a little tip. If it's gone really wonky, then we might do a whole nother uh, Facebook Live dedicated to that, where we actually um, show you how to rubber band sections of comb in. So there we go. Any questions? Yes, yeah, so there are a few questions coming in. When you mentioned before um, about that dark honeycomb um, and you said to repurpose it, what would you actually do with it? Okay, so the way you cycle out frames in a hive is you, uh, if you've got multiple brood boxes, you can move them from one box to another and that's the way it's conventionally been done. However, not all beekeepers can do that because they've got either different size boxes for collecting honey or they've got a flow hive and these frames don't um, fit in the top box. So what you can do is wait till there's, uh, cycle the old dark ones out towards the edge. Typically they put honey on the edges. Wait till there's no brood in it and then you can take that frame right out. Um, if it's naturally drawn like this, you can simply just get your hive tool and cut out the entire frame after getting the bees off, of course take that away you can enjoy, um, enjoy chewing on that or crushing and straining it to get the honey whatever you want to do it's always a good thing to take to a party people love it and the conversations that spring up around beekeeping are amazing you can take the honeycomb away and the bees will just redraw it if you've got foundation you'll need to take that frame away and put the foundation in and bring it back or better still you've got one pre-prepared and you can swap it on the spot so that um, you don't leave a gap in the hive because if you leave gaps in the hive the bees will fill it with random comb and that'll be another problem to fix. Oh great Cedar, a few people saying yeah they love, someone recently went to a restaurant and had honeycomb on a cheese platter which was pretty nice. A little extra tip on that point actually, if you find that you've, you've moved it to the edge but there's still a section of brood on it but that section of brood is, is kind of small but you still want to allow them to, to emerge from their cells then you can actually put it sideways under the lid and I'll show you how to do that right now on this other hive. So if you, um, if you take the, the roof off, which I'm going to do right now on this hive, uh, hang on a second, I think the, I didn't undo these uh, side wings. So the inner covers come, come with it here. Okay, come down. Have a look. Okay, the actual issue here, I think, is this roof's not quite um, square, so it's grabbing the roof. Uh, an assembly, assembly issue there. So if you have a look at this, you've got um, an inner cover. You can pull out this cap here by gently teasing that out and that will allow bees then to access this roof cavity area. So what you could do is grab your, your frame like this and rest it under 
the lid and it does sit the lid up slightly but that's okay and notice how um, there's a bit of space underneath it which is what you want for the bees to to work um, sometimes if the comb's quite bulgy you could put another couple of sticks just to lift it up a little bit you want the bees to come up through the hole around and be able to service that comb and any any uh, bees can then emerge in this space and go back into the hive you can wait till till the uh, the brood has all emerged and then you can take that away for honeycomb again so a little tip there if you do end up with a frame with a little bit of brood on it you can use the lid space to let them emerge the queen can't get up there because of the excluder here so there'll be no more brood that going in that frame that, okay that's fantastic cedar um ray hawkins is asking he's from orange new south wales and recently got a swarm and he was pretty excited he put it in his box on sunday just wondering should he feed them any sugar syrup the uh you can feed sugar syrup to your bees and if they're starving then that's a really good idea but if there's flowers around then you don't need to. Bees are, are quite good at foraging and they will collect from your surrounding area so just tune in with the bees to see whether there's there's a lot of flowers around. You might even notice the weight of your box increasing if you just give it a little lift and and they're getting very light and there's, there's not much um, nectar at all or you pop the lid and have a look and they're really not storing any honey stores then feeding them could be a really good idea we just better come back here and check on this honey jar you can see we've got a nice full jar of honey already well almost full we'll leave it here a bit longer let the remaining honey top up that jar and that'll be fantastic for our tea room here it's such a joy to be able to just walk out and harvest another beautiful flavour of honey. As you can see here, we've got different flavours in the hive. You've got, this is the latest one that's been coming in, a lighter, more floral flavour. And this one here is the, the darker multi-tones we get in, in the winter. So you, you'll enjoy the different flavours and the Flow Hive allows you to isolate those flavours. So I'd really recommend just having a single frame to a single jar or a single frame to multiple jars but um, I don't harvest all of the honey into a single bucket anymore because it's like mixing all the flavors in your kitchen together it's still nice but more enjoyable to taste those flavors of all the different species in your area and it's a real joy for me to be able to share those flavors with those who, who come to visit and it, it creates amazing conversation as well so we've still got a hive open over here so we'll get back to doing our inspection meanwhile if you've got any questions put them in the comments and we'll keep answering those okay so notice our little smoke has fallen over it's a good idea to get it going again sometimes you need to put a bit more fuel in it but it looks like we're doing okay there i usually just use whatever i have around people often ask what to put in a smoker I say whatever's easy, uh, a bit of garden mulch, leaf mulch, uh, some people hang old hessian sacks on the fence and let them dry out and use that, people even use cow dung, so whatever's going to create a bit of, bit of smoke, but stay away from um, things like magazines with lots of print on them that are going to have perhaps toxic chemicals for, for the bees, so I might just give them a little bit more, they've been open a while. You might notice I'm not wearing any gloves. That's typical of a beekeeper that gets experience. But as you begin, wear your gloves, protect yourself. And uh, it's only once you get comfortable, you can experiment with um, taking your gloves off. Let's have a look at this next frame. Oh, thanks. So sorry, Sina. Um, look, this is a bit of a long question from Nicole. Um, the, her bees were only able to fill and cap a few square inches in a couple of their flow frames um, so some of the honey was not capped. She's pulled off the super for winter and she's not sure what to do with a little bit of honey. Should she empty it and use it before it's capped or should she just leave it when she packs it up and put it back on her hive in springtime? Okay you've got a few options there and the you can either, if you've got a, a cold room, or perhaps it's cold enough, I'm not sure quite where you are, 
then that will stop the honey from fermenting so it, or, or a chest freeze you can put them in there and then just put them straight back on the hive in spring or alternatively you could harvest the honey in the frames and um, it's a little bit tricky to do that on a bench but you can do it and um, and then uh, store them for winter too but if you're going to store them in a warm place then you could get fermentation occurring on the frames so the, the putting them in a in a cold room is probably the best bet but if you don't have that available then um, it's usually better to harvest on the hive and let the bees lick up the remaining bits and then you've got dry frames to store so um, there's a few few things to, to consider there Great, Cedar. Thanks. A couple of people were wanting the same answer, so that's good. Um, Lance is asking, just wondering, um, because we don't use the um, wax comb, would it is it an advantage to um, to use the wax foundation to just sort of say that it's one little job they don't have to complete themselves? Um, bees are incredible at drawing their own comb, and my experience if you give them wax foundation in here and you leave one of them with none they'll draw the one with none first before they move on to the wax foundation so they'd rather um, just hang their comb and, and get going like that so um, I don't think it's an advantage uh, in that respect but there is advantages in other ways if you put a wax or plastic foundation they will be nice and straight some beekeepers really like their frames perfectly straight so you don't get any of these wonky bits as you pull the frames out it makes it a bit easier for management especially if you've got thousands of hives to do so for that reason beekeepers will often put the foundation sheets in and it's also in the beginning you don't have to do that uh, thing we were showing you in, in the beginning of, of bending the, the comb back in line if they've gone a bit wonky so you can set and forget a little bit if you've got the foundation sheets um, depending on where you are in the world there might be other reasons you have to get into the hive but uh, it's definitely um, if you've got a lot of hives to manage you might choose to use the foundation sheets or perhaps you've got a mentor that's done it that way all their life and they really want to show you how to do that it's cool to learn how to do the wax foundation sheets I'm certainly glad I don't have to do it anymore because it's a tedious work that I don't have to do. I'd rather let the bees uh, do it. And also, I think there's a bit of a health benefit. You're not introducing wax from, from other hives and you're also letting the bees size the cells perfectly for themselves. So, so there's a few, few things to consider there. My father, on the other hand, prefers to use a couple of foundation sheets and then the rest, um, the rest naturally drawn like this. He likes to mix it up so they've got a nice straight guide to start so it's up to you really our frames are built to accommodate wax and wire foundation plastic foundation or we also include the comb guide if you want to do the naturally drawn comb like this I'm looking down these cells and I'm seeing the uh, young larvae I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it on camera but let's have a look I'm just going to move some bees out of the way but down the cells you can see the grubs which is the caterpillar phase that's the larvae phase before they go through their metamorphosis in this area here you'll see the white uh, shining grubs in the bottom of the cells and that's a great thing showing there's the queen's been laying the bees are, are going about their first process they'll be fed royal jelly for the first three days of their life then they'll be fed plant proteins which is their bee bread collected made from pollen and that through epigenetics changes the bee from being a, a, um, a queen into a worker so as soon as they have fed the plant proteins they switch and become a worker bee and the difference is amazing if they can if they continue to the, to be fed the royal jelly they'll turn into a queen they'll supersize they'll have bigger legs they'll live for six years instead of six weeks it's um, an incredible change just simply on what you eat a good lesson for us humans <laughs> that is so good the trans bender bee food <laughs> <laughs> well That's they're not changing gender no. <laughs> really but they're changing they're, they're changing uh, um, from a worker which they, they are female, they've got exactly the same genetic code as a queen, but they don't tend to have, have the ability to lay. 
However, if they lose their queen for a long time, some of the workers might start laying unfertilized eggs and, and unfertilized eggs create drones, right? So drones uh, are the unfertilized um, eggs and they're the male bees and they don't collect honey, they don't collect nectar, they don't collect pollen, they don't look after the babies, they don't make comb. Um, <laughs> so if you end up with a pile of drones inside your hive, your colony is going to get pretty unproductive <laughs> very fast and, and, and die out, um, which, you know, it, it <laughs> it's amazing and interesting how they're organised and just how organised they are. Here we've got a lot of nice brood on the frame. You can see here, you've you've got this um, this uh, capping that's a little bit less see-through compared to the honey up the top here. So there's the honey, and you can see the honey glinting down the uncapped cells as well. And right next to it, you've got the brood. So after a while, it's very easy to tell the difference the difference between the two, honey, and then brood here and here and what you're looking for is a nice brood pattern you don't want to see sunken dark cappings with piercings in it but always be keeping a lookout for those um, diseases that you could get in your hive as you go through your your inspections so when will that brood start to hatch cedar so the there's a, a about 11 days in the larvae stage and then once it's capped over the the bees have uh, the grub has spun a silk cocoon around itself and the bees have topped that with wax. The, um, there's another about 11 days as they go through their metamorphosis and then they will chew their way out. If we have a good look here, we might even get a chance to see one chewing its way right out of its cell. Wow, that's incredible. Cedar Kenneth wants to know, have you ever accidentally dropped a hive or a brood frame? Certainly. <laughs> yeah, if, if you tilt this frame over and it's not well connected to the sides because it's got no wire strands in it or no plastic foundation sheet, then sometimes it can just fall right out. And you usually only do that once because you feel so bad about this big section of brood and bees falling to the ground. So that's a hard lesson learnt. Um, I've also tipped hives over, or hives have fallen over themselves. I've knocked hives over mowing with the tractor. Once I was driving along the, a row of hives in my paddock and, and uh, I tur turned the, um, the, the tractor around and came back and I was like, oh, I didn't notice the hives had fallen over. Like, hives on the ground with bees going everywhere. And I'm like, oh no, better, better, better get my bee seat. And uh, then of course I realized that the back of the tractor must have just clipped a hive and knocked it right off its stand. So <laughs> I certainly had my fair share of debacles. Another hive, when there was a flood, I actually slipped down an embankment and dropped into the water and floated down the creek and I had to fish that one out. So all sorts of things happen when you're managing lots of hives, especially if you don't quite have time to um, move those hives into a, a better location than on a slippery bank. Okay. Cedar, is there anything, um, Jay's saying she's got a bit of an, um, or they've got a bit of an aggressive hive, they're getting stung about 300 metres away from the hive and they seem to follow them as well. Oh, that's no good. Yeah, if you've got a hive like that, oh look at all these bees, if you, if you look down between these frames, there's all of these heads looking up at you. It's um, such a cool view to see all of these little heads poking up between the frames, checking out what's going on. And bees can actually recognize faces so and they can also recognize the difference between one artist and another there's been studies done where they've put Dali's work and Van Gogh's work or something like that down a, down a tunnel way towards towards their hives and then they switch them over and they can still tell which hive is theirs and then they uh, use different types of art from the two artists and they can recognize the difference between the artist's work and go to the correct hive. Extraordinary uh, visual recognition that bees have which makes sense because of the incredible navigation they can do and the way they can communicate in the, in the hive as well with their, with their dancers. Getting back to the question, if you've got an aggressive hive that's um, being a, a nuisance, uh, not fun to have around, you, what you need to do is change the genetics of the hive. The queen mates in its first week and won't mate again. 
and when it does that it's got the genetic code for up to six years of laying and uh, unless they they divide and she swarms um, then you, those genetics will stay with you so what you need to do is order a nice gentle queen from a queen breeder get in there find the queen get some help if it all feels a bit daunting take her away and put in the new queen and that way the genetics in three or four weeks will change over to that nice gentle calm genetics like this hive is and it'll be much more of a joy to to work your bees Mm, thanks Cedar. Um, Peter Cox, our flow ambassador, has just joined us from South Australia. So morning Peter. Yeah, Peter. Um, and Cindy's asking how many supers can you leave over winter? How many supers can you leave over winter? So that's a question that's probably best from your local beekeepers. It depends where you are in the world. Here we just leave the supers on year round because we're in the subtropics and we get a lot of nice honey over the winter and we can keep harvesting through the winter time lucky us if you're in an area where um, and it depends a bit on your mentality of how you want to manage your hive so conventionally what beekeepers have done is they've stored honey on the hive rather than in jars on the shelf and they've got quite big stacks of hives even up to uh, five six seven supers high on top of their hive come winter time uh, just for winter they'll take a lot of those off and leave just one or, or two boxes on for the for the winter and the idea is you sort of size the colony um, down a bit give them less area to look after less area to keep warm and over that winter time with a flow hive of course you can just continually harvest honey um, you don't need to stack lots of boxes on top if you don't want to however if you choose not to have uh, lots of boxes um, more than more than two boxes they're more likely to swarm so what I tend to do is keep them in this kind of configuration if you have a look at our apiary here they've just got a single brood box and a single super then come springtime what we do is we uh, get in there and take a split from the hive so if you get into the brood box as, as the population grows you take off the window and you can hardly see the comb surface Good idea to get in there, take some of the frames out, put it in another box, and that way you can expand your apiary. And if you don't want another hive, somebody else will. So it's fantastic to be able to give that gift to somebody else to start beekeeping as well. So that's the way I tend to do it. In the colder regions, people often will add another box. So there might be three hive with a brood at the bottom, either a second brood and then a super. A super is the honey collection box on top. In our case, it's our flow frame invention. Or they might go a single brood box and two supers. So getting back to answer your question, if you're in a really cold climate, it gets a long cold winter, many months without forage, good idea to reduce the size over winter. And you might just reduce it to a single brood box and a single super and put the other one in, in away for the winter and uh, try and keep it away from vermin and the like and best to keep it cool if you can so that you don't get any fermentation if there's any remaining honey and keep it away from other bees that might find that and want to steal that honey because you don't want to share pathogens around so that was a long answer but um there is a little bit to to wintering and we've got a great video in our beekeeper.org series if you want to tune in have a look at that it's at thebeekeeper.org and it's a course we've put together from beekeepers from all over the world showing you various different things which is fantastic. I'm not an expert in winter. Go through that wintering process where we are but there's other beekeepers in there that are and we've put together an amazing amount of training material with very well put together videos that are um, short and to the point and able to show you exactly what to do in the various different stages of beekeeping. It's also a fundraiser to raising funds for habitat regeneration and protection so check that one out if you want to it's free to try and uh, otherwise you can keep asking questions here and we've got lots of live videos on our YouTube Facebook channel um, showing you various different things about beekeeping also let us know what you would like us to cover and we'll try and make a nice uh, Facebook live to help you learn as you go
in your beekeeping journey. Fantastic. Lance is a little bit concerned that our jar might be getting full cedar, so, but Lance, okay. I think we're pretty good. So let's so. Have, have a little look at that. <laughs> um, good idea, thank you. Um, <laughs> It's amazing. Uh, we've certainly had people remind us to swap the jars when they're just about to overflow. But usually, when you're harvesting from a, a, a into small jars, so if you're harvesting into small jars, you might get six, seven, eight little jars for one frame of honey. But in this case, we've got a, a jar that's actually sized for about what a full frame will take. This frame wasn't built out so far, so I'm not expecting it to fill it all the way to the top. So there'll be a little bit more if we're patient, it'll, it'll keep filling up or else we could leave the last bit to go back to the bees, put a little cap in there and the honey, um, the last bit will drain back for the bees to reuse. So it's a nice big jar of honey though, if you, if you look at that, that's um, it, even one single frame here will keep your family going for at least a few days. <laughs> Especially if it's your family. <laughs> so, you know, Abdul's asking, um, how do you get rid of the problem of honey theft by other bees? I guess the okay. robbing. Okay, so robbing, that's an interesting one. So bees can get a taste for honey rather than collecting nectar. And they'll usually do that if they've got uh, honey available. So if I was to wander off and forget and leave this jar there, come back in a few days, bees would have found that honey and literally drained the jar and taken it back to their hive. Then what would happen is the bees, rather than go out and find flowers, they will they will go after honey from weaker colonies. So they might find a colony that's just starting out or a colony that's lost its queen and the numbers are a bit low, and they'll ambush it with a lot of bees and uh, take that honey and take it back to their hive, which is not a good thing because you're sharing pathogens around. So you really want to avoid robbing if you can help it. The telltale signs for robbing, uh, you see bees trying to get in every little nook and cranny and crack and they're kind of frantic as they buzz around and they're, they're covering the outsides of hives. If you see that behaviour, what you need to do is close the entrance down. Now, to do that you need to um, either use a couple of bits of wood or whatever you have just to reduce the entrance size or you could even put in some grass mulch. Um, why don't I show you how to do that right around on, on the hive we're working on and you can get a good idea of how to do that. If you put grass in the front of the entrance, the bees can then pull it out when they're ready and, and that's a, a, a way you can, you can not have to come back to that hive if you're managing them in far away locations as well. So it's a, a nice little tip. If you have a look at this um, entrance here, the front of the hive, then what I'm going to do is just pick up a bit of grass mulch and let's reduce this entrance down. And the way you do that is you just shove it in like that and you go along, wear your gloves if you're new to beekeeping. And what you'd want to do is close it down till there's only just a small gap for the bees to come out, a one bee wide, and that will make it a lot harder for those robbers to get in and decimate those weak colonies. If they're still persistent, and you'll see like tussles happening at the front with your, the colony defending itself and bees, you know, in, in locked uh, in headlocks and rolling off the landing board and whatnot. Um, if they're still persistent, then you might even close the entrance up altogether for, for a day or so just to limit that chance of the weaker colonies getting robbed and the problem will go away. So uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, reducing the entrance is the way you can stop robbing. But in the first place, if you can uh, not leave honey around, so you could forget and leave leave a frame up uh, leaning up against the, um, yeah, like this. Let's say we left that on top of the hive. It's got a little bit of honey in it. The bees will come and forage on that and get a taste for honey instead. So you don't want to leave honey accidentally around. I've certainly been guilty of that managing a lot of hives and you leave a frame of honey leaning up against a tree, bad idea, it's not good. You're sharing pathogens and promoting robbing. Um, the, the other uh, thing is um, if you're seeing robbing when you're harvesting is covering up your jar like, like we showed you earlier. And, but one of the most important things to do is 
keep an eye on your B numbers. If the B numbers are really dropping, you could get to the stage where you've got what's called a dead out, where there's actually n not a, a functioning colony anymore in the hive, and that's when other bees could opportunely go in and raid the last bit of honey and take it back to their hives. Of course, if you've got some pathogens in that hive, which was the reason uh, uh, of the demise, then that's being shared around to other colonies. So removing dead outs from your apiary is really important. Get them out of there. Don't let them get robbed by other bees. Great question. Mm. Thanks, Cedar. Um, Sean's in North Brisbane in Queensland here in Australia. Just wondering, just about to install um, their new, just wondering when should they do their first inspection? Okay, so um, it's fun to get in there and, and watch, so there's no limit on when you can do it, but um, if I was just installed it, I would wait at least a couple of days before I went back in there, let them settle in and um, then enjoy the process of them watch, watching and learning as you see them draw their honey on. If you're using foundationless frames, you get to watch that beautiful honeycomb pattern they're making. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it really depends a bit on, on your strategy. A lot of beekeepers, when they're learning, like to get in there often and check and learn. Uh, and as, as you get more experience, you get a feel for when you need to, to get back in there. Also, depending on which um, country you're in and what, uh, what issues there is in that country, there may be a requirement to inspect more often as well. Here in Australia, there's, um, we don't have the varroa mites, so it's a little less demanding for us. And um, that hopefully it stays that way. Great. Okay. Cedar, um, Margie managed to grab a swarm a few weeks ago, um, so sort of put it straight into her flow hive, but hadn't managed to be able to paint the outside of it. Do you reckon she should, she should paint it now with the bees in it or just wait? Look, you, you can. Um, the, and I've certainly done that, but it's, it's really up to you whether you feel comfortable doing that. Um, if the bees have got established brood in there, they won't uh, leave even if there's the smell of fresh paint around. Uh, so you can actually um, paint the hive. Another thing you could do is block the entrance really early in the morning and that'll give you a hive with, with only a few bees that perhaps stayed out the night before hiding under a leaf returning. Um, but as you can see, the, the back of, of these hives is often free for you to give them a coat of oil or paint and the bees won't won't really mind. The hardest bit is in front of the entrance, so you could seize an opportune moment, perhaps really early in the morning, to do that entrance bit when there's not a whole lot of bees uh, at the entrance. But wear your gloves and, and, and the bee suit. Protect yourself while you do that. Cedar, are those bees working on both sides of the frame or are they working down? So they're, they're working on, on both sides of the frame. So they start at the top, like that first frame we just pulled out, which you can see on the side here, like that. They start at the, the very top from the comb guide, hopefully, and then they work their way down as they build and then start connecting it to the edges. They rarely will connect it to the bottom of the frame. So you, you can see here, they've left a gap at the bottom, which they they like to do. And on the other side of the frame, they're working so they, they work uh, double-sided on a frame and they, they work back to back and it's very specific in a hive. So if they're working back to back, the spacing is about nine millimeters they'll leave between comb surfaces. And uh, so between these two combs, you'll find it'll be about a nine mil gap throughout and they'll follow that even if it's a bit curvy. So when you're putting your frames back, it's a good idea to put them back in the same order so that, that you're maintaining that space and the bees can then service that. Um, if you've got parts of comb touching each other, you put them back in a different order and this bulgy bit here is touching another bulgy bit, the bees will have to chew all that away. Could be an opportune moment for the hive beetles to get in there while the bees can't chase them around and lay their larvae in that section. So nice idea to respect that bee space and make sure the bees can service all the parts of the frame. Coming to the edge of the hive, you've got uh, 
about a six millimeter gap. If they're working one-sided against a wall, they'll leave about six millimeters from comb surface to the edge of the hive. Having said that, if there's a generous space, they might leave a larger amount of room between the comb and the wall. Great, um, Inspector Todd. I love how our um, Flow High customers notice all these things. I've noticed that there's some staples in those uh, brood frames and just wondering, would you recommend that? Yeah, well that's actually Trace who's uh, asking the questions <laughs> has put together these frames and she's a fan of the staple gun. So if you're doing a lot of frames, you might work out a way that's quicker. We provide these nice little nails, but um, you can get a little staple gun from your hardware store and um, speed up the process if you want to. A little bit of glue is good because that holds the frame together. The staple really just holds the frame together while the glue dries. Celia, you mentioned before about a good brood pattern. What is a good brood pattern? So a, a good brood pattern is when you're seeing a, a lot of brood in the center frames of the hive. If you're seeing, um, oh look at that, I haven't used any smoke in a while and they've just started to go for my fingers. I'll just show you that right now. I've just got a little sting in my finger. So the way to get that out is just to scrape it sideways. There's a little gland on a gland on the back of the stinger which is pumping venom into my finger right now. So you don't want to squeeze that or it'll pump more in. But if you just move it sideways, uh, then what you do is you scrape that out and limit the amount that's going in. So uh, we've got more on first aid on links on the bottom of our website as well. Perfect timing so, actually. Cedar, one of the questions was, do you think that smells like a ripe banana? <laughs> Um, there is a, a smell from the, uh, the, 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 the alarm pheromone of the bees is, is said to be like that, uh, the ripe bananas when they get really, really ripe. But now, um, because I, I don't want that smell on my hands, what I'm going to do is get this smoker going again, which has, has just uh, uh, run out of fuel. So just by putting some of this, which is now wet garden mulch in. But we've got a nice hot furnace below, so it should smoke up okay. And then what I'm going to do without burning myself is smoke my hands again. And that way I've masked that uh, alarm pheromone um, on my hands because I would rather the, the bees calm down. Now what we're going to do is actually close up this hive now. They've been open for quite a while. We've shoved things in their entrance and we've mix things around and they're obviously getting a bit sick of it. So we're going to make sure the frames are in the same position. I could add a little bit more smoke as I do this. And um, just to mask that alarm pheromone and uh, make it a, a bit easier to put the frame back together. So this one goes in like this. And of course, if you don't want stings on your hands, wear your gloves. Um, typically, if you don't wear gloves, you'll get some stings on your hands sometimes. Uh, depends on whether, whether you uh, really don't like stings or not and how, how you react to them. Um, okay, so I'm just going to move all of these frames back. It's important to respect their spacing as we were talking about earlier. So you, you want to make sure their back nice and close together and that way the comb guides are, are about uh, 35 millimeters apart which is suitable for what the bees are doing. Now I'm just noticing that um, there's been a muddle up here the way this frame has, has actually been spun around so here's a great example of what I was talking about and what you want to avoid is see how there's a bit of a bulge in this section here and a bit of a bulge on the other side. I'll just add some smoke so you can see it a bit, a bit more clearly. The bees will vacate that little zone there. So if I push these together, then the comb's gonna to be touching. They can't actually work it, can't service it, and the beetles could take over. And that's happened because, because I was showing you both sides of this frame and I've actually put it back in the wrong way around. So what we're going to do is pick that up again, turn it around, it's typical to get a bit more honey and a bit more bulges honey as you go towards the edges of your hive. Now that's the way 
it was in the hive. As you can see now you've got a nice curve here that's matching the curve on the other side. Okay. So do, do they tend to build their comb because it looks like from this uh, brood from the back to the front? Like do they start their comb building at the back? Not necessarily. The They'll often start at dead centre in the middle and work out from there but you will find bees that will start from the edge and go that way and in this case you're quite right and it's probably just where the swarm wall first started as this was a swarm we just shook straight off a branch into the box and they must have started their first comb back in this region and they've worked their way out from from that corner of the hive so it all depends really but typically it'll be center out towards the extremities there we go so if you've got extra space in your box like we have you'll appreciate that space for managing your hive you want to leave that on either side so your combs have the nice spacing all the way across so we've got time for for one more question and we're going to be closing up this hive now and putting it all back together and uh, they seem to have calmed down since I've added that little bit of smoke to the hive. <laughs> Fantastic, Santa. There's actually lots of questions coming in, I'd say, from our um, northern um, customers who are all talking about your, the supering. So, as you said, that's a, there's a lot of information on the beekeeper.org. Um, Maria's wanting to know, needs to move um, their hive on the weekend um, and just wondering it might be too heavy. How heavy would a hive be if it's full of brood and there's, it's full of honey as well? Great question. Get some help for sure. <laughs> that hives can be very heavy, especially if you've got the larger uh, size 10 frame Langstroth or we call it a flow hive 7 because it's got seven of our flow frames across it like this hive has here. There could be a, could be 30 kilograms in the top box or even even more by the time you add up the honey and the box and everything depending on whether you've got the lighter western red cedar or polonia or whether you've got the the bit heavier aracaria wood now this one was a little tight to, there we go um so the, and then you've got the rest of the hive the brood box is a bit lighter but you could have uh, a hive that's uh, <laughs> as heavy as uh, a, uh, uh, a person really if you've got extra boxes on top so you need to get get some help and if you're going to move that a long way or transport it on a vehicle you would take the, the roof off you put some straps around it nice strong straps those ratchet type ones really pull the hive together and generally if you're just moving single hives the home bee keepers tend to take an opportune moment to close that entrance really early in the morning or, or the night before. A little bit of smoke can help to get the remaining bees to go in and you close the entrance, you've got it all strapped up, get some help to lift that um, when you're going to move it. If you're moving at a short distance you can just pick it up um, with a couple of people under this area here. Don't grab the landing board at the front, it will break off and you can put your hands right under anywhere under the bottom of the baseboard and give that a good lift like you can see me doing there and uh, you can then just lift it and w walk uh, a few meters and put it down again and you can slowly inch the hive across a yard like that if you're wanting to move it a short distance there's more on moving beehives at the beekeeper.org if you want to have a look at, at our online course it's designed to take you from knowing nothing about beekeeping at all to a deep um, even scientific knowledge we've got scientists in there explaining very intricate and exciting things about beekeeping as well so take a look at that it's um, free to try so there's no harm in getting in there uh, and getting a, a look at that and seeing the, the quality of some of the videos we've put together now to finish off this harvesting process you can see we have uh, got a nice jar of honey here for the tea room and all we had to do was turn this handle and the honey flowed out which is the whole dream come true for my father and I in making this invention um, work and it's another dream come true to be able to share it with you all around the world so all I'm doing is putting that key back in the top slot, giving it a turn, and all of those comb parts are moving back together. The bees can now go about their business, and you can already see them in the side window. This is the frame that we've just harvested, 
the bees are standing on their wax capping, they've hardly noticed what's going on and you'll see a few starting to chew away as they're going, hang on a second, there's a, a, no honey underfoot, we might just take off that capping and have a look and a busy hive in, in a day will tear off all that capping, refix the cells and the honey uh, making process begins again from the beginning. Thank you so much for tuning in and asking so many great questions. If you've got more questions, put them in the comments below. Also let us know what you'd like us to cover next week and we will uh, be, have something new and exciting to show you next time. Thank you.